welcome to Yadi Yah Radio. I'm Yan, it's my uh, pleasure to be with you on our Shabbat uh, program. We have Kirk with us uh, this evening. Good evening, Kirk. How are you? Good evening. I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, we might even have JB later this uh, this evening. I think he's back from his uh, sojourns. Um, we uh, would like to uh, offer a special welcome to uh, to people who are not listening this evening, to those who will listen to an archive of this program a year from now, three, five, seven, maybe even ten years from now. Uh, we would call them uh, Yisrael and Yahuda. They would probably refer to themselves as Jews. But the program tonight is, uh, uh, and will probably be for the next few nights, and truthfully, every program we do is for Yahweh's chosen people. I recognize that most of the chosen people don't feel very chosen these days. Uh, they are the brunt of most conspiracy theories. They are uh, abused and demeaned in every possible way. But it doesn't change the fact that Yahweh chose them. And he made a promise to Abraham such that he is going to call them home and is going to reaffirm his covenant with them. And so our purpose, our mission, is to share what Yahweh revealed through his prophets such that Yisrael and Yahuda, those who would refer to themselves as Israelis and Jews today, might come to know who God actually is. That they might come to wholly disrespect and disregard their rabbis, their religion, their patriotism, uh, their military, everything except one thing, which is the ethnicity that made them God's chosen people and the words that God revealed on their behalf. There isn't a lot, Kirk, that God had to say that wasn't primarily intended for Yisrael and Yehuda. It doesn't exclude us, Goyim. No. It, um, we are uh, beneficiaries of everything he said. There isn't anything that he said that we can't benefit from. But we were not the intended audience. And that's never going to change. <laughs> and in this case... That's just fine. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to begin in, uh, in Mismore 5. Uh, I think we have announced that the third volume of Observations for Our Time uh, began by translating Mismore Psalms 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in the first two chapters. Ultimately, I would like to um, get all the way through Mismore 24. Um, just going sequentially one after another. And I might even go into some things that are considered apocryphal. Uh, I was reading the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls um, today, and a couple things were, were really interesting, uh, Kirk. The first of uh, is, all right, of the books of the Torah, Prophets and Psalms, which one do you think was the most beloved by the um, community in Qumran? You know, you've got some spectacular things. You've got Barashit Genesis, the creation account, and the story of Abraham. You've got uh, Shemot Exodus, and the, the, the story of, the, uh, of, uh, of um, freedom from slavery in uh, Egypt. You've got Kara, Leviticus, and all of God's instructions to his uh, people. You've got Dabarim, uh, which I think was the most quoted by Yosha. Uh, that um, is is the Torah interpreted by the man who Yahweh asked to scribe his words. And then you have so many spectacular uh, accounts, and particularly in, in books like Samuel, who was the last of the of the judges, the Shaphat. And then all of the accounts that tell the story of Dode's life, and then Dode's uh, songs, and uh, 
and his uh, Michelle Word pictures. And then, of course, the, um, the great prophets, Yasha Yah, Yerma Yah, Zachariah. So of all of this, mm-hmm. what do you think was the, uh, the, the by just virtue of had the most copies? And I'll tell you, the number of copies was 40, 40 scrolls mm-hmm. on this, with the next favorite having 33. What do you think it was? I'm, I'm, I would think it's Yashi Yah. Yeah, it's not. With Yashiyah, we it's not even close. But uh, with Yashiyah, oh, wow. we have we have a wonderful um, uh, treasure in that it's the only scroll that we have where the entirety of the of the scroll was preserved. There was nothing of it that was destroyed, and so it's the only complete scroll from beginning to end. Because all of the others, they're all made out of parchment, and the others, mm-hmm. you know, the the extremities of the the soul where it was either scroll was either too tightly round in the center or exposed to the elements on the outside began to disintegrate and you know in those jars they all began to disintegrate to a large degree and and so we have a treasure with uh, the great Isaiah scroll and we have the entire thing but no it's not Yeshua yeah. so my second guess would be the Psalms it is that's it yeah I would have thought uh, I would have thought one of the First um, three books, or the yeah. or Dabarim, the uh, the last book of the Torah, is what I would have thought. Dabarim is second, with 33 copies. But there are 40 copies of the Mizmor. Nothing was loved as much by the chosen uh, people in uh, Israel. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that while there's a number of uh, of Psalms that don't appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's not because they weren't included, it's just because, you know, they disintegrated, you know, and we just don't have everything. Um, but there's just shy of 20 that are in the Qumran collection that are not in the um, the Christian and, uh, and Jewish um, um, accounting today. Hmm, I didn't know that. Yeah, and se- several of them either speak directly of Dode or were written by Dode. Wow. So there's uh, there's really a wealth of information to learn. Uh, and uh, while there were probably two or three of them that were known to have existed outside of the, what they call the conical um, editions, but yes. the majority of them, until we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we didn't even know existed. So it's, uh, it's interesting. This is the fifth Mismore. Um, we are now... Um, uh, point of reference: 21 pages into Chapter Two of Volume Three. Uh, when this comes up, and I'm not, we're not going to try to to wordsmith this, where we go into every single word and analyze it. We'll do that in a future program. But I wanted to read the Fifth Mismore because the last statement of the Fifth Mismore leads us to Yashia 40. And to not go to Yashia 40 after reading the last statement in Mismore Five. It's just to be lazy. It's just to say you really don't have any interest in what God's saying. You're not thinking while you're reading it. You're you're looking, but not contemplating, because it sends you right to uh, Yeshua 40. And we're gonna go through Yeshua 40 because wow, it's a treasure too. And then in Yeshua 40, we're going to come to a uh, a word that can't be translated as uh, it's initially introduced in the Torah, Zeroa. And then we're going to do what what we should always do. When we run into a, a challenge, you work it out. You look at every place the word's used, and you, you come up with a definition that can be used in all places. Um, and that's tailored based upon the context. And we're going to do that with Zerwawa. And it's going to lead us to two statements I didn't expect going to lead us to Yashiga 53 and the introductory statement of Yashiga 53. And then it's going to lead us to a uh, what I would call the initial Sermon on the Mount. Um, you know, to some degree, there's actually three Sermons on the Mount. Um, I'm taking the religious concept away, but it's a play on words here. Uh, Yahweh had one where Yahweh spoke directly to the children of Israel 
reciting from his Torah. Scared the scared the bejesus out of him. Yeah. Um, that's when they asked Moshe, said, no, 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 we're not going up that mountain with you. Uh, we're going to hang down here, and, and, and we want you to uh, be our intermediary because that voice, man, that that whole idea that it's the creator of the universe that's looking at us and speaking to us, man, it makes us really uncomfortable. So, no, we don't want to do that anymore. But that's one. Mm-hmm. And the second is uh, the one we're going to consider. Solomon and the dedication of uh, Yahweh's uh, house, the temple. Uh, where there's a statement that um, uh, was not what I expected. I'll tell you that by a, uh, a long shot here. And then um, we're just going to analyze what the words say and let people form their um, their own conclusions. Fair enough? Mm-hmm. All right. So, Ms. Ms. Moore 5. A Ms. Moore song of Dode. The Beloved. To the Enduring and Eternal Director accompanied by stringed instruments. So understand that as we begin this, that in Hebrew, that there was a cadence to these words. That this was written as lyrics to a song. And that makes them much more powerful because we get uh, music uh, and the melody in our head, like, you know, um, yesterday was never as as melodic as it is in the Beatles song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's there are so many things where, like people, the Barbara Streisand song. Um, easy to remember. Yeah, you know, the uh, I Calypso of uh, of uh, John Denver. Denver. Yeah. Um, Scarborough Fair. Just words that, because of the music that they are encapsulated in become much more powerful and easy to remember. So that's how this was written. So there's a lot more skill involved in writing lyrics than there is in writing uh, prose. I mean, I'm proof that any dummy can write prose. But writing lyrics, poetry, uh, that's tough. That requires artistry. I am encouraging you to choose to diligently listen, to thoughtfully consider, and then to appropriately respond. So that of your own free will, you pay attention and carefully evaluate, coming to understand by weighing each word, testing their veracity, and then pondering their implications, giving serious thought to every nuance. Because I really want you to offer the proper response after rationally analyzing my words. Each meaningful phrase and promise. Now, up to that point, you would have expected that this would have been written by Yahweh to Dode and through Dode to the rest of us, right? Right. I'm encouraging you to diligently listen, to thoughtfully consider, to appropriately respond so that of your own free will you pay attention and make a careful evaluation so as to understand by weighing each word, testing the veracity, pondering the implications, mm-hmm. because I want you to offer the proper response. Now, you would have thought, wouldn't you? Well, yes. But it isn't. No, no. Because it says, these lyrics from the branch. The next word, these lyrics from the branch. Yeah, I was not the branch. The ocean didn't say these words. They're lyrics written by Dode. These lyrics from the branch. Even the shortest of them. And especially the most expressive and evocative statements. Yeah, well, because I want you to choose to understand... Well, now he's admitted that it's Dode speaking to Yahweh. Now, why in the world would Dode tell Yahweh, I'm encouraging you to choose to diligently listen, to thoughtfully consider my words, my response, and then of your own free will respond appropriately. Why would Dode have the audacity, the chutzpah, to sing this to God? I mean, I sure as heck wouldn't. Why? No, he has the best relationship. He really gets it. And, and he gets it. He yeah. he understands that Yahweh's whole intent 
is for us to communicate, us to engage in a mutually beneficial relationship where we act as father and son, where, where we are family, where we make a contribution, as does God. He wants God to take him seriously. He has given us a lot of thought. I'd also tell you that as I was thinking about inspiration today, I, I came to a conclusion that, that might be scandalous. And, you know, I, again, when it comes to my conclusions, they're, they're my conclusions. It, uh, I could be wrong. And I have no problem with somebody saying, no, that's not right. I want my translations to be right, and I would certainly like my conclusions to be right. Uh, but um, you're free to, to disagree. I don't think Yahweh inspired everything his prophets wrote, word for word. I don't think he was giving dictation much of the time. Uh, sometimes when Yahweh was speaking in first person, yeah, mm-hmm. write it down exactly as he said it. Mm-hmm. But the vast preponderance of what we receive is not that. When you translate a lot, one of the things you come to realize is that the vocabulary of Moshe is very different than the vocabulary of Yermaya, which is very, very different than the very sophisticated vocabulary of Yashaya, which is very different than the poetic vocabulary of Toad. Now, if they were all just taking dictation in their inspiration as prophets, the vocabulary would all have been Yahweh's. It would have all have been the same, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it isn't. If it were just these guys writing down what they were told, how in the heck would Chaba Oak say, what's wrong with them? God, you can't die? Speaking of the insanity of the dead God on a stick in Christianity. If God were inspiring Dode to write these songs such that he was dictating every word to him, what we just read is impossible. It's ludicrous. It's only meaningful if Dode was, was so. yeah, was um, shown things, able to perceive things, able to understand things, and then convey what he saw, what he experienced in his own words. A proof of this would be Dabadim. Dabadim is absolutely unequivocally not in Yahweh's voice. Mm-hmm. It's all Moshe's Moshe. voice. It's all Moshe. So it's Moshe's interpretation, Moshe's application, Moshe's teaching and guidance on what he learned from Yahweh. And that's the way God likes it the reason why we're going to find out that Dode is returning with Yahweh. Not Yosha. I mean, this notion that God's going to come back with a diminished manifestation of himself is craziness. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. I mean, Yahweh makes it very clear. He's returning. And it makes no sense whatsoever for him to return with a diminished manifestation of himself. But if he can return with his beloved son and can continue to work through his beloved son, brings him great joy and satisfaction. And it gives him the ability to achieve what he intended all along, which is to work through us and with us. So anyway, this is this beginning here is the confidence that God's son had that is beyond any of us. The confidence to say, God, I really want you to listen to my words. I'm writing these words not only for you, but for everybody else who will listen to them. And when you listen to the lyrics of this song, knowing that that it's going to be shared with people for the next 3,000 years and maybe even beyond that, I want you to acknowledge that they're correct. I want your affirmation and uh, response. Wow. Hmm. 
that's the kind of relationship, though, yeah, it's intended. It's the kind of relationship that put Dode in the catbird seat. Especially, in fact, as I read this, uh, what do you think of when he says, um, I really want you to offer the proper response after rationally analyzing my words? Each meaningful phrase and promise, the lyrics from the branch, even the shortest of them, and especially the most expressive and evocative statements. I didn't uh, notice this when I wrote it. I sh probably should have. What is that reminiscent of? We've heard that before. Well, it's more like when Yah was talking to to the rest of us more than him talking to someone talking to. Well, it certainly Dota is, is sharing this to, for our benefit, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, um, the, I want you to analyze the shortest of them, talking about each meaningful phrase, the shortest of them, and especially the most expressive and evocative statements. You know, remember a, a fellow named Yosha? Mm -hmm. Climbed up on the hill yeah, when you and spoke about, about uh, the, uh, the Torah? And he said, not the, not a jot or a tittle, not the smallest, shortest expression of the Hebrew alphabet, nor all of the tittles, all of those illustrative, the longest strokes, mm -hmm. none of them are going to be annulled so long as the heavens and earth exist. Very similar expression, isn't it? Yeah, it's also in yeah. Dogarim, except for the tail end of it, when he talks about the smallest letter, because there is no smallest letter in the pictographs. So it would have been... That's true. Moshe, you know, but when Yahusha, I always felt that when when Yosha said that, he was really insulting them the, uh, right away, because they have reduced the only part of his name that represents him to the tiniest yes. little stroke in the whole alphabet. So, to me, Correct. that was Isn't a, that something? a slam and a yeah. hole. Yeah. That's interesting. Because if you, if you look at them, well, I do think there's one letter that probably, um, in terms of its just overall impact of the, the size of the stroke, was probably smaller than some of the rest of them. Uh, well, that would be the wall. Overall, the you would say, boy, that's a tiny little letter. Like the, yeah, like the, the but the ten peg would, would be the wall, would be the closest to that, right? And, of course, that's just yeah, because the smallest actual letter means to increase, mm -hmm. to become bigger, <laughs> to add to. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the letter that depicts his hand is so much more than a hand. It's an upper arm and a forearm and an open hand. There's a lot to it. Oh, yeah. yeah, so I, I agree with you. It's what uh, it's what they had done to his uh, his alphabet. Um, in fact, I was reading today. Um, uh, I'm sure this would be the highlight on on most people's literary uh, de desires. Um, I was reading uh, for Q. Dute today, uh, not from the uh, uh, Dead Sea Bible, but from the uh, the actual photographs of the parchment. Uh, wow. And you say, why in the world would anybody in their right mind read uh, 4Q Dut? But uh, and that's um, for the fourth scroll at Qumran on uh, Deuteronomy is uh, what that stands for. Uh, and this particular one, you know, is is only a marginal uh, importance in the sense that it was written in 50 CE. It was written as a Herodian uh, text, so that the the script now is the uh, the block letters of Babylonian Hebrew, uh, but without the diacritical markings. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I was reading it because this thing was scribed. You know, the last of the the Qumran scrolls was written uh, in like 68 because of what the Romans did in 70. Uh, that uh, I was reading it because I had I had previously written, and I'm editing uh, the terms volume of um, of an introduction to God, and I had previously written that um, Shemoth Exodus 20 is not extant in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and therefore we don't know if Yahweh wrote Nasa or Nasha, and the third statement he etched in stone. Mm -hmm. One means to uh, to lift up, to promote, and the other is to uh, to corrupt and to pervert. Very different concepts. And it's all whether it's a sin or a shin. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because we don't have uh, Shemoth, Ex 
Exodus 20, I can't tell you which one he wrote. Well, that was pretty naive of me. You know, I do some dunder thing, dunderhead things from time to time. It's the difference between reading what Yahweh inspired men, his prophets, to write and translating them and then trying to understand it and share with, uh, with everyone what you've come to, to perceive and being you know, the actual conduit himself. Well, there's two things that I screwed up on in that statement, and I've just now been in the process of correcting them. Screw up number one. Mm-hmm. The uh, the ten statements that Yahweh in stone aren't presented once, just in Shemot. Um, uh, they're presented a second time. The body. Moshe repeats everything that's important, right? So you not only see them in uh, Shemot Exodus 20, they're repeated in Dabarim, Deuteronomy 5. And guess what? Four. Q. Dot. Uh, Dot is um, has it. It's the oldest rendering of the Ten Statements. And the second. So I should have just turned to it and uh, and said, Oh well, you know, okay, it's it's um, a passage we're translated and and uh, here in Shemot uh, names uh, Exodus doesn't have it, but it's uh, it's repeated in Devarim, and uh, I can we can just read it there. Uh, the second is, how in the world is is a document written in the first century CE? A document written in 50 CE. That's when that 4Q dude was written. How is that document going to tell us if it was a Shin or, or a Sen? Nasa or Nasha? That's a trick question. It won't. There are no diacritical markings. You got the letter, which looks like a, a, a an English W is what the letter looks like, and it's differentiated as a sin or shin by the diacritical marks, which were added in the late century, in the 11th century. Well, in the first century CE, there was no Masoretic diacritical markings, and so it's the same letter. Hmm. And so now, now, you either have to apply both concepts, or pick one or the other based on the context, because it can't be differentiated from the text, is the answer. And so reading it in Fordute uh, from that Qumran scroll and and what is now the Badim 5, I was able to confirm that, yep, there it's there. And by the way, even uh, those that that find variances say that, well, Shoah, which is the other interesting word, that was corrupted, uh, that, uh, well, there's alternative meanings that the English translations don't properly convey. But thank you very much. There it is. And so, you know, we follow it, do your diligence. You're in a position to uh, to learn. Um, but uh, so that was my uh, my fun for, uh, for today and the things that you find when you do that. So, yeah, well, because I want you to choose to understand because it's, our mutual desire. So when I said, you know, earlier that the reason Dode is doing this is he understood exactly the kind of relationship that Yahweh wanted, well, I cheated because I knew what he would write. Because it's our mutual desire to make all of the connections between us so that we fully comprehend everything there is to know. Considering the information with our full attention such that we become well-informed regarding my thought process, even my meditations, my musings and mutterings, my considered statements and fervent deliberations. We have talked about, you know, the idea of what it means to potentially be a choder, an insignificant stick that Yahweh is using to write a neck, the sign and banner that he wants to lift up that contains the the testimony of, of Dode and his um, and Yahweh's prophets, and um, we'll eventually get to the Nakri and what this foreigner would uh, would write. But uh, what we really should have an appreciation of is the difference between where we are and what we have to work with 
and when Dode existed and what he had to work with. Do you think Dode had um, a concordance so that if he wanted to understand, uh, for example, Zoroa, that he had a concordance that he could use that showed you every place that was used? As a matter of fact, when he was uh, writing, could he read Yashaya, Zachariah? Nope. 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 No. In fact, he couldn't even read Shamuel. He had the Torah. No concordance, no other tools, no lexicons to to flesh out all the potential meanings of a word. No word processor to get uh, to polish the work. In fact, he was writing on parchment animal skin, so you got to get it right the first time. No magic eraser. When you consider the tools that he had to work with and the fact that he didn't have a scientific understanding of the creation of the universe, of dimensions, of light, we do. Mm -hmm. And we have marvelous tools to use to translate. He didn't. And we have all of the prophets that have come afterwards to use to view this marvelous portrait from so many different perspectives. He did not. And when you realize all the things we had to work with and how inadequate we are by comparison, the fact that all of our communication isn't based on any idea that we've come up with, but strictly to celebrate what he came to realize, what he wrote, with every advantage that we have, I think it puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. I want you to choose to listen attentively, as I am desirous of you accepting what you hear is true, and then being inclined to respond accordingly. Our choices and desires being in sync, being receptive to the sound of my urgent and significant request, my king and advisor, my leader and counselor, and the authority I consider, my God. Indeed, because exclusively unto you and for you I intervene and intercede, make requests and furnish justification, persuading others to your point of view. I think that the single most important thing we can achieve in our lives is to have our will be in sync with us. Our perspective to be in sync with God's. Our understanding to be in sync with God's. When, when who we are is in sync with our Creator's, we are living the, we're maximizing our potential and usefulness in life. Uh, it's just flat out can't get any better than that. Mm. Dota achieved it. So, he's saying, you know, with all of this, we're in sync. It's a powerful statement. And he's speaking here to God. Because for you, I intervene and intercede. Well, we've always thought, we've been told that Yosha is the intercessor. Mm -hmm. That's not what this says. Yosha was the Pesach lamb. It's more of a scapegoat than anything else. It's the, it's the individual we, that our inequities, our depravities, our twisting and perversions are placed on that's a sacrificial victim. Yes. Doe is saying he is the intermediary, the one who intercedes. So how is that possible? He didn't serve as the Passover lamb. How is it possible? Because he teaches us how to understand everything. Yeah, he's the guide. He's the guide. He's the real shepherd. He's the guide. His words. He's intervening as a shepherd, as a guide as an illustrator, as a lyricist, as an example. 
He's the implement that Yahweh is using to reconcile his relationship with his people and to draw them into the covenant, which is indeed Yahweh's point of view. And he, he earned that position by the following. Yahweh, in the early part of the day, when it's best to attend to and inspect, to look at and consider, to seek after and gain information, it's then that you hear the sound of my voice. At daybreak, I make arrangements and prepare myself for you, such that I am competent and correct. And I pattern myself after you, making particular, purposeful, and orderly preparations such that I'm ready for you to deploy. Taking the proper positions to be valuable and worth using so that I can engage quickly and thoughtfully. Taking immediate action on your behalf. Then I remain watchful and focused. What's not to like about this guy from Yahweh's standpoint? My gosh. What's not to like about him from even our standpoint? I know, that too. I mean, it's obvious from us, but I mean, Yahweh's way above us, and he's, he's got to like yeah. this guy. Yeah. Um, well, love him. Yeah. Absolutely love him. He is, he's got it. He is recognized, I'm going to give you the best part of my day. I'm going to focus on what I can learn such that I'm prepared, such that I'm correct, I'm prepared, I'm ready to go. Therefore, you can use me. So many people want to be used by God to serve God, but they're unwilling to put in the effort that enables them to be useful. You know, I've gotten a lot of flack, a lot of pushback when we first read the uh, the Choder thing, and and I'm getting even more. I uh, will get more. I've only gotten, uh, I think, one or two uh, hate letters so far on the uh, the NACRI uh, thing. But the bottom line is, it can apply to anyone that does what this paragraph says. There are some of us that get up in the morning and walk straight down to Yah's Word, and spend hour after hour after hour preparing themselves to be useful. I, know, I, I saw your uh, your eight pages of notes uh, that came uh, to me today, Kirk. You did. I do. I know several other people who do. Yeah, well, JB's really good too, man. Mm-hmm. Stuff he writes is amazing. It takes time. It does. But no did it. Made him special. For you are not a God who is willing to accept that which is wrong. It was one of the things that uh, J.B. did a spectacular job on. Mm-hmm. Uh, circumcision, which most people get wrong. And the book of Enoch, which was the source of so many conspirators. And I know God's not going to accept something that's wrong. Reveal what he says, and, and if you want to argue with what God says, good luck with that. That's up to you. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that, but okay. <laughs> no, I wouldn't recommend it, but a lot of people do it. For you are not a God who is willing to accept that which is wrong. That means that faith alone is not going to save you, is it? Because faith in the wrong thing is wrong. Yeah. Yes. Who will waver or is swayed by that which is fraudulent? Well, virtually every aspect of Christianity, indeed Islam, Mormonism, socialist secular humanism, Political correctness, multiculturalism, fraudulent. Who is willing to endure or desires injustice? And injustice is more than than you know not standing up and fending off, protecting those who have been injured. You know that the whole mentality in uh, in America, whether it be the Trumpites and the uh, the neocons that make America greats again, who um, who are fixated on all manner of conspiracy, many of which uh, blame Jews for everything, and the others uh, immigration. It's my country; you can't have it. Um, that mentality doesn't work with God, and that's what he's uh, what he's talking about here. You. Yeah, 
is just an injustice. And the uh, the left, the uh, the Bernie Sander types that uh, that think that the one percent should cough up uh, everything that they've made, uh, and it should be um, distributed among those who have not been productive. It's an injustice. No right to it. Or who is inclined to view the malicious and malevolent favorably. That which is counterproductive and harmful cannot congregate or dwell together with you and is completely alien to your nature. That's why there will not be a single religious person in heaven, not a single patriot. Not one. Neither the arrogant nor the foolish, neither those who slander nor the irrational, neither the thoughtless nor the celebrated in renown can appear or stand before your presence. You abhor and are hostile to detesting and loathing, hating and shunning, never showing any compassion to all of those who engaged in practice or advance, that which is deceitful or corrupt, twisted and perverted, encouraging worship which is damaging to the relationship and idolatrous. The first sentence of the first paragraph of the first chapter of the first volume of Observations for Our Time reads, H is a virtue. I think Yahweh just said the same thing, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Hate is a virtue. We need to know what to hate and how to hate. Now, God didn't say here, pick up a damn stick and beat him to death. No. He used his words, as should we. You destroy those who lie. Yeah, he can. But he destroys those who lie and has up to this point, not by wiping them out, but by condemning them with his words. You destroy those who lie, especially those who promote false gods, anything which is contrary to reality, which misleads and will disappoint. Bloodthirsty individuals and deliberately misleading and deceitful men, especially those who guide, using guile, pretending to be truthful. Yahweh sees as repulsive and hates, viewing them as an abhorrent abomination. God does not love everyone, and he hates many. But as for me, through the abundance of your mercy and steadfast love, even familial favoritism, I will arrive and have chosen to enter, while also guiding and directing others toward your home. That's what it was all about. It's what life is about. It's why the universe exists. It's why we exist. And Dode has the confidence that says, you know, I've chosen to enter. I realize that uh, it required some mercy on your part and some steadfast love, um, and that's why, but I'm going to arrive, and I've chosen to enter. But, you know, I'm also going to devote myself to guiding and directing others to your home. Mm -hmm. made I've chosen on my own initiative to convey an informative announcement, explaining this verbally, showing and making this known, as it is the purpose of your family and my desire to continually speak, such that I make it absolutely clear that I have decided to explain what I know as clearly as words allow regarding your set-apart temple and residence, with all due reverence and respect to you. Nothing we can do in this life surpasses. Exposing the truth condemning lies as they pertain to the covenant. May it be your will and desire to lead me such that we continue to learn additional reasons to trust one another. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, it gets goosebumps when I read stuff like that. It's, it's what uh, I think we'd all love to grow up to, uh, to have this kind of of, uh, of courage, this kind of uh, credibility, this kind of relationship, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, okay. uh, oh yeah. You know, and it's and there's more to it than just 
don't have any audacity to say that I want us to continue to learn additional reasons to trust one another, and that would mean to trust me, as Dode is saying, speaking to God. But he's also saying, I want you to, to share information with me so I learn to trust you even more. Uh, that's something that most people wouldn't have the audacity to say either, right? Well, he's comfortable in his own skin, isn't he? I mean, he right, he, he knows. is. Knows. What's the purpose of all this revelation? So that we can come to know and trust Yahweh, right? Right. Mm-hmm. That's the purpose of it. So the more we learn, the more we're going to come to trust him. What's wrong with saying it? Uh, nothing Just because good. we're puny and he is big? Now, if he did all of this so that we would be in that position, why not acknowledge it? I want you to continue. Yeah. I want us to continue to learn additional reasons to trust one another. And, you know, uh, I don't think that it it dawned on me until uh, this Nacri thing that we're going to read from Solomon's lips at the dedication of the uh, the temple. That it really does go both ways. I mean, I can see it with Dode. This guy was special. But for the rest of us, I never saw it both ways. I do now. It really is important that we devote ourselves to being trustworthy as it relates to Yah's message. We are far more useful, living far more productive lives, pleasing Yah all the more when we can be trusted to accurately convey his message. I think that's a big deal. And I think it I don't think Toad is saying this just to present himself in a unique position. I think that he is saying this because he's inviting us into the same position. You know? Somebody else out there uh, wants to join us in contributing to the neck that Yah was going to lift up? Wonderful. Have at it. Prepare yourself. Make the contribution. Respond in a way that is trustworthy in this regard. And join us. The more the better. You know, what it does say, you know, I'm, I'm going to guide and direct others to your home. May it be your I'm desire and will. Yeah. May it be your desire and will to lead me such that we continue to learn additional reasons to trust one another, choosing to guide me, creating opportunities to direct me to a favorable outcome, relying upon and trusting each other. You know, I uh, I told you the path that we're going to take to get to the dedication of the temple in Solomon's speech. Mm-hmm. One thing led to another, and then to another and to another. We were guided to this place. It's the same thing that, that uh, Dode is saying. We were directed to a favorable outcome relying upon and trusting each other, learning ever more in the process. Now, it's the next statement that we're going to read that is the reason that we're starting with Mismore 5. And look yet how much we've learned by going to the beginning. Learning ever more in the process, Yahweh, in what you know is right and vindicating, appropriate and prosperous, honest and true with regard to responding and providing answers to those who, acting as if an authority, are adversarial and opposed to me, including the empowered to govern in an adverse and hostile manner when compared to me, especially those who contentiously lord over others. It isn't enough, not nearly enough, for us to study and understand the word of Yah to appreciate what the Mikre represent, to appreciate what the terms and conditions and benefits of the covenant are. It isn't nearly enough to share
share what Yah is looking for and offering in return. Because unless we expose and condemn man's most pervasive myths, patriotism and politics, um, religion and militarism, unless we do that, then there isn't maybe not even one in a million people that can be receptive to the truth. The lies are too popular. They're too pervasive. They're too crippling. And throughout time, it's either been uh, uh, deadly Mm -hmm. to deny the prevalent religion or politics or military, or it has been so unpopular and they're so... um, uh, demeaning to do so that none would dare so none would dare do so and that's why I'm constantly reminding people you, you know you want to be used by Yahweh absolutely it's what we're all called to do but understand it is a very very lonely endeavor and you're going to have a lot of people that write horrible things about you, that say horrible things about you, because they don't much like what God has to say, and that you end up having to impugn everything that man clings to and believes, conspiracies, religion, politics, patriotism, militarism, all of it. Not a lot of people really want to bear what it's like to be to lose family and relationships with family because what you say is inconsistent with political correctness, inconsistent with their their multicultural views, contrary to their religion, contrary to their patriotism. But that's what Dodd is doing here. He's saying, you know, we need to know what to say so that we trust one another when we continue to oppose those who are powered, those who govern in an adverse and hostile manner. Even those who are adversarial and opposed to me, that's what Dota's saying. I know there's a lot of people that, that uh, I didn't do it in this most recent case, but when I've actually read some of the horrible things people have written about me and, and tried to, to set the record straight, and they say, you know, why are you doing that? It's uh, that People just ignore them. Well, in today's world, it's hard to do to ignore people because they can post their horrible attacks such that, that they go viral and they're found everywhere and it destroys your credibility, which would be fine except for the fact that in this particular case, there aren't a whole lot of people providing accurate and comprehensive translations of Yah's word or insights that help people understand them. And so being undermined in that context is a really bad thing. And, and therefore, you need to do what Doe did. Be prepared to defend yourself. In all cases, you don't. I mean, the most recent long, long, long letter demeaning me, I didn't read a word of. I didn't even say who wrote it. But we are taking the time to... to last week, we went over two of the misconceptions in the letter. To, uh, this program, and however long it takes us to get to the other, the next... Um, we're devoting ourselves to the other misconception. Because unless we expose and condemn those who are in opposition to Yahweh and in opposition to us representing Yahweh's words, then there, there isn't one person in a million that's going to benefit. It's what you got to do. I think uh, for so many people, uh, and this was used to be true of about 90% of those who are, became part of the covenant. Uh, now it's it's probably only uh, true of 5%. But um, until I wrote Prophet of Doom and then did 5,000 radio interviews on it, exposing Islam as a terrorist manifesto, um, I, I didn't earn people's trust until I did that. And the courage to do that, to to take the time to learn the truth about Muhammad and to write about it and to speak about it and to do so confidently and intelligently using words, not like these idiots out there that use uh, bullets and bombs, but using words to reveal the truth on behalf of Muslims, on behalf of those victimized by them. 
when you do what Dode's doing here and you confront those who are hostile to the truth, who are enemies of the truth, you're doing an extraordinarily important thing. And for us to be effective, we have to do both. And Yahweh and all of his prophets do both and do it consistently. This is the statement. It's uh, the conclusion of Mizmor 5.8 that uh, is going to bring us to Yashaya 40. Speaking to Yahweh, Dode says, You want to engage with me. You want to engage with me such that your way is straightforward and right, <clears throat> positioning me such that I become like you. And your path is considered correct and on the level in my presence. Where have we heard? Prepare a path that is considered straightforward and level in the presence of Yahweh. Ever heard anything? Does that ring a bell? I mean, when I translated this, like the gongs were just going off in my head and said, Oh my, I, I, I know that Yahu Khan and the Mercer. It's yeah, covered somewhere in the, in the book of Yahu Khan early on. Uh, and the citation is really similar to this. Yeah. You want to engage with me. So that now this statement is about Yahweh engaging with Dode, such that your way... You know that there was that your way makes you know straight the way. Your way is straightforward and right, positioning me such that I become like you. And your path is considered correct and on the level. And my presence. So guys, who said it? <coughs> well, don't said it first. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's true. And who said it second? <laughs> Yo, Conan. Uh, no, he said it third. Oh, he said it third. Uh, uh, probably Yosha. Uh, no. Uh, oh? Yasha Yah. Yasha Yah, well. Ah. Yasha Yah in the 40th, what we now call the 40th chapter of his book. He said it uh, He said it uh, second. Uh, Yao Conan, the immerser, said it third. And Yao Conan, the disciple cited him and set it forth. So we're now repeating it. <laughs> fifth, right? Came in fifth. That's all right. That's good. Yeah, but let's just think about this now. We're now going to uh, consider the text of Yeshaya 40. All because we find not only Dode saying it first, Toad saying, you want to engage with me, such that your way is straightforward and right, positioning me such that I become like you, and your path is considered correct and on the level in my presence. That would mean that the citation, and if we're making this connection correctly, that the citation that Yao Khan and the Immerser quoted and then uh, Yao Kanan, the disciple, wrote down in his book, which is attributed to Yosha and his arrival, is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not that the citation is wrong, it's misapplied. That it doesn't apply to Yosha, it applies to Dode, is what it means. It didn't apply to that time in 33 CE or 30 CE, but to Yao's return. In 2033. Yeah. They got it wrong. Yeah. Yet again, this, this inability to recognize that the most important person who ever lived is Toad. Not Yosha. And for those that said, oh, how can you say that? you got this crush on Dode. you got a, uh, a bromance with him. And, and that, uh, you know, you're diminishing the importance of our marvelous Savior. No, I'm not. 
You're in tune with Yahweh. I can't diminish you're just recognizing what relative to Yahweh, Yosha, to the extent that he's already diminished. Yes. Just can't. Yosha is, a, is, a, is diminished from Yahweh by infinity to the fourth power times the speed of light squared. My little brain can't even wrap around that concept. Now, if you think I can diminish him further than that, and that's the reality, good luck with that. And there is no way to overemphasize Toad because Yahweh sets him up as he is my son, he is the anointed Messiah, he is the king, he is the branch, he is my hand, he is the, the Zeroah, he is the Gabor, the powerful leader. You tell me how you can use the branch, you tell me how you can elevate Dode's importance in this story more than Yahweh already has. Impossible. Yeah, my friend told me the other day, he says, you imagine the uh, how misguided people have to be to think that when Yahweh comes back, he's going to put a crown on his own head. Yeah. What's going to be doing with Yosha? Why would he do that? I mean, come on, folks. Uh, it's truly amazing. Well, if only Israel had listened to their king's fifth song. If they had recognized that their Messiah had come and would return. And had come to trust the beloved Son of God 3,000 years ago how different their history would have been. Can I share that again? Not for the audience listening tonight, but for Yisrael and Yahuda, Israelis and Jews, who will listen to this recording or read this book. Three, five, seven, ten. 12 years from now. If only Yisrael and Yahuda had listened to their king's fifth song. If they had recognized that their Messiah had come and would return and had come to trust the beloved Son of God 3,000 years ago, how different their history would have been. Had they acknowledged the testimony of Dod, they would not have suffered under the Moabites, the Assyrians, Babylonians, Macedonians, Romans, Roman Catholics, Byzantines, Muslims, Ottomans, the British during the mandate, the Nazi Germans, the Soviet Russians, the Poles, the Ukrainians or the so-called Palestinians. And even now, it's not too late. Fellows, we have previously discovered that the single most cited messianic prophecy, Yeshua, Isaiah 9, 6, a child is born unto us and a son is given to us, actually pertained to the Gibor, mighty and valiant warrior, Dode, and was addressing his second coming, not Yosha. You know, that is, if you study rabbinic literature, and it's important to, to study some things just to understand what the mindset is. How in the world were they, they so confused? Well, the reason that they rejected Yosha as the Masiach Messiah is that the prophecies regarding the Masiach Messiah were clear. He was going to be a Gabor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yosha was not a Gabor. He didn't qualify. A Gabor is a mighty warrior. It's a heroic individual that defends his people in battle. It's a big, strong man. It's not well, Yosha. Why didn't that wipe out Akiba? Well, because 
No, Akiba picked a Gabor. Well, I know he a was rotten a scoundrel of a Gabor, didn't... but Akiba picked a Gabor, and you know the and to Yobel uh, later, and uh, and um, one thirty three. Yeah, I understand that, but why? Two years that... later, he realized that the reason that that Jews didn't accept Yosha as them as their Masiak Messiah was because he was not a Gabor. So, what did he pick? His false Messiah was a Gabor. He was a warlord. Yeah, but but why didn't that send him looking to the Torah to find Dode as his Messiah? Oh, why well, he'd missed Dode? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that well, I think this is the the issue, is that is rabbis are smart and stupid at the same time. Mm -hmm. A lot of professors are that way. Very, very. I mean, it's uh, full of of knowledge, and uh, the processors work at uh, at substantial speed. But uh, their their um, hearts are and minds are closed, and so. But they knew the time was broken into three 40 year bell increments. They knew that time from expulsion to the garden to Abraham and Yishak on Mount Moriah was 40 year bell, 2,000 years. They knew that from the time of, of Abraham and the affirmation of the covenant to the time that the Passover lamb was going to come was 2,000 years, 40 year bell. 33 CE. They knew it. Mm-hmm. And they knew that Yahweh's time of man would conclude and he would return 40 Obel later, which is now 2033. They knew it. They knew that the Masiach was supposed to come. Well, not the Masiach. They knew that God was going to do something extraordinary with the Passover lamb in 33 CE. They knew it. You get that from Daniel. The prophecy is in Daniel. They could do the math. Uh, mm-hmm. that every bit of of the Torah points to a plan that is uh, six plus one. You know, right after Yahweh presents the Moed Mikre of the path home, which is a six plus one path, he presents the Yobel of the year of the Lamb's redemption. How much clearer do you have to make it than that where all slaves are freed where all debts are forgiven and the land is returned to you it's all laid out Hosha even talks about the two days and then on the third what would occur a healing they know it you know I can guarantee you I wasn't the first to figure out that timeline they know it uh, but unfortunately God doesn't fit in religion, not the real one. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the reason yeah, why. one they can control. Right. Every religious god was manufactured by those in the religion, without exception, throughout man's history, including Allah and Jesus Christ. So we now know that that Yashaya, Isaiah 9, 6, the Gibor, the mighty and valiant warrior, is dote. And now, thanks to Mizmor 5, we are being led to reassess the second most cited Messianic prophecy, that found on Yahoo Kanan, the Immerser's Lips. I'm going to read this from the KJV just so, because that's what's familiar in people's minds. He said, I am the voice of one calling out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah, John 1, 23, KJV. Now, while well, we should have recognized it long ago, his citation of Yahshua Isaiah 43 was wrongly attributed to Yosha. It's so obvious. When considered in context, we should not have needed Dode to bring it to our attention. You want to engage with me such that your way is straightforward and right, positioning me such that I become like you and your path is considered correct and on the level in my presence. 
But the religious are so keen, unquote, mining, of doing what Shaul, Paul, did incessantly, which is to truncate and remove a statement from its context to mistranslate it and then misrepresent its original intent that this citation is thought to have announced God's arrival circa 30 CE, not 20, 33 CE. A particular, particularly pathetic example of this is, of quote mining, is Christian citing John 3.16 to validate Christianity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not die but have eternal life. Not recognizing that it appears at the conclusion of a long conversation which began with Yosha ridiculing a religious leader's ignorance of the Torah. This kind of quote mining leads believers astray, such as the case with the New Testament's misappropriation of Yahshua Isaiah 43 and Yahu Kanan 123. That is not to suggest that Yahu Kanan was wrong. Um, in quoting the prophet, should he have actually said this, or that the disciple was errant in including his citation in his book, should he have actually done so, but only that it does not apply to their time or to Yosha. It actually pertains to Dode, and especially to the way Yahweh intends to use him in year 6000 Yah. Yasha Yah's prophecy is profoundly important to Yahweh's people, Yisrael and Yahuda, and that is why Yahweh is bringing it to our attention. There is, there was no way in 30 CE or 33 CE that Yisrael is going to accept Yahusha as the Masiach. He didn't meet the qualifications. He was not anointed by Yah. And they knew it. And since that time, they have been tortured and mass murdered and slandered as, as those that killed Jesus and should by every right despise that name on all the hell that has been unleashed on them by Christians and Muslims. There is no way that God's going to get what he wants, which is a return of his people, if it is dependent upon them recognizing, falsely recognizing, Yosha as the Messiah. It isn't going to happen, and it shouldn't happen. But it's an entirely different reality. If what they're being asked to recognize is that the Yehudim of all Yehudim, the greatest king of all in Israel, God's beloved son, the one that was Masiach anointed not once but three times, if all they have to do is listen to and act upon the words of Dode, then they will indeed come home. And that's why we're focusing on them. Not only because Yahweh does, but because it's the right answer. And it means that you need to look at these words with an open mind and a, and a fresh perspective. And it's one of the reasons I want to emphasize why, uh, you know, some might think that me speak it's too much. Just read the dead gun translations and let people form their own opinions. Well, what if I were to tell you that the preponderance of the prayers that the minions of rabbinical Jews recite at the wall that Herod built beneath the Temple Mount are Dodes, Mizmor, Psalms. They can cite them all by rote. And yet they can't figure it out. There's more to it than just knowing what the words say. They're reciting it in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. There's far more to it than, than just being able to recite the words. You've got to make the connections. You have to understand. You have to be willing to learn. You've got to be able to draw the right conclusions and insights and then respond appropriately. And that's why we spend so much time not only sharing Yah's testimony, but explaining what it means to all of us. But in this particular case, 
We are focusing on Dode because Yahweh is calling his people home through Dode. And if you're a Goyim, a Gentile like me, and you, and you say, uh, well, you know, thanks very much, but you know, I'm tired of all this uh, Jew-loving stuff, and I'm a Goyim, and you know, I've got every right to uh, God, too, and I'm going to go find somebody that, that isn't so in love with Yisrael and Yahuda. Well, uh, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because the only person that's going to be of any benefit to you is someone who is sharing what Yahweh has said, cares about, and loves. And he happens to love Dode, Yisrael, and Yahuda. And if it wasn't for Dode, Abraham, Yisrael, and Yahuda, um, we wouldn't have anything none of what we're sharing would be made available to us or, uh, or uh, matter to us, to anyone. I want to also tell you that, that remember Dode when he said all those profound things, I mean, chutzpah beyond anything we can imagine, he said, but he explained it by saying that that his mindset, his perspective, his understanding was in sync with Yaz. Mm-hmm. If you want yours to be in sync with Yaz, you're going to care about what he cares about. What does he care about? Yeah, no, Dode. Yeah, he right. cares about Dode and his people. His covenant family. Yeah, his covenant family and his people, Yisrael and Yehuda. And so um, that's why we focus on what's important to him. It's pretty hard to go wrong in life if you care about what God cares about. And you know, I am frustrated as I'll get out with the Yisrael, the way the country exists now. I mean, half of their non-existent constitution, but their letter of agreement gives like 50% of the control of what happens in that country to the rabbis. The other happened, the other half to those who are political. It's a power-sharing thing, very similar to the Roman Catholic Church and the heads of uh, uh, kings of Europe. It's a mess. They're reliant on their uh, Israeli defense forces, not Yahweh. Mm-hmm. No one in Israel uses Yahweh's name places religious up the wazoo. Lots of things not to like. But what matters is they're still Yahweh's chosen people. Still Yahweh's home. He's not coming back to New York City. He's not coming back to London. He's not coming back to Ferris. I sure as hell not coming back to Mecca. Salt Lake City. He's coming back to Jerusalem. Yahuda, Yisrael, and on behalf of his chosen people. This is the way that, I was on that now that Dota has brought it to our attention. Um, uh, I want to share the way that uh, Yeshua 40 begins and to go through it because we're going to learn a lot. So we're going to interrupt what was a review of Mismore 5 long enough to determine the audience to which. Um, this prophetic statement was originally addressed to assess whether it will be f- or when it will be fulfilled, whether it's been fulfilled, to ascertain the change in thinking that will precede this occasion, all while considering the portent of the promise being shared at the same time. And I think all of those questions are answered in Yashia 41 and 2. So, uh, let's begin there. Yashia 41. Choose to change your thinking and relent, and you will be comforted and consoled. Nakam, nakam. By electing to reconsidering, altering your opinions regarding what is true of your own free will, you will find relief from your sorrows and distress and will be encouraged. Peel imperative. Your choices will cause you to experience this result. My people promises your God. Well, that's the issue. Mm-hmm. There's not a single issue more important than that. No, no concept more important than that. Yahweh cannot help his people until such time as his family, Nakam, choose of their own free will to change their minds, their thinking, their perspective, and relent such that they can be comforted and consoled. They have to stop referring
referring to God as Hashem, the name, mm-hmm. as Adonai, my Lord. Call him by name. Completely reject the rabbis and their religion. Completely reject their politics and their military. And come to trust Yahweh exclusively. That's what they need to do. By Nakam electing to reconsider, altering their opinions regarding what is true, they will find relief from their sorrows and distress, and they will be encouraged. This is the reason behind the necessity and purpose of the covenant's lone prerequisite. Walk away from your country, away from Babylon, Babylon, away from your father's family and the family of man, and away from societal norms, mores, and presumptions. Until and unless this occurs, God remains unknowable and salvation is unobtainable. So that's a pretty good first start. Uh, JB, I know you've been out uh, uh, doing lots of things with family and friends and a little vacation tucked in there. And and Kirk, I know that you spent some time on Yeshaya 40. Uh, Did you begin on 1 or did you begin uh, on uh, 10? I actually did the thorough stuff on 10, but I've I've done a little quick review on uh, on 1 just to find out... uh, what the key words were, but I haven't done my normal uh, goodie. But uh, but all of that in the calm to come is, you know, like you said, it's in the field imperfect, which I thought was interesting because it's intensive. That means, what that really means is intensive active verb and its mood and its voice and it expresses a uh, positive instruction to another person, which the reason I bring it up is because the language, I mean the uh, grammar, which I never did much before a number of years ago, um, the grammar tells you everything about it as far as what it's trying to be said. So yeah. it's another, to me, it's another layer when you're trying to understand something where you say, well, there it is again, that's that, that's that, and that's that. And then uh, with Nakam, you know, that's, uh, I, I did I did Nakam, which was the main word in here that, uh, there, which is actually what you said, is change the mind. It can be regret. It can be to relent. But it also says to think better. <laughs> in some yeah. lexicon, which makes perfect sense. Uh, obviously, it's translated a lot as comforted, and the King James and so forth, which is fine. But that's well, I have a problem with that. You know, choose your thinking and relent, and you will be comforted. Yeah, you will that's, be comforted. But that's yeah. kind of a result of changing one your thinking. One leads to the other. Better. Yeah, one leads to the other. Well, that's what God is saying. <laughs> Choose yeah, to change so your thinking, yeah. and you'll be comforted. One leads to the other. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if exactly you that way. And you, it's all right there. So it's uh, it's not. Yeah. yeah. I think that Hebrew is uh, is special because of the stems, the moods, the conjugations, uh, as well as the fact that all verbs uh, exist uh, in time uh, and all time manifest all time, and also because of the moods and. And here you have a uh, a stem and a conjugation. Mm-hmm. And you're right. The uh, the stem defines the nature of the relationship between the subject and object. And Hebrew is a relational language. It's the only language I'm aware of where there exists where virtually every verb is designated with a particular stem. Each of them establishing a a very structured relationship between the speaker and those being spoken to, between the subject and the object. And in this case, it's God speaking to us. And so with the peel stem, um, that that what your your choices here are, are going to, and the imperative speaks of free will, um, second person volition. So your choices, the imperative, Mm-hmm. It's going to cause your uh, you to experience the result of the the verb. So, good thinking, rational thinking, uh, opening your mind, changing your thinking is going to cause you to be comforted. It's um, it's a marvelous language in that regard. Yeah, you know, a language yeah. that's that written at its core to express free will and relationships. 
and that is um, written so that it's liberated in time, like light, where the mm -hmm. verbs exist in the past, present, and future simultaneously. You know, so the, all the conjugations uh, talk about is whether an action is finite or infinite, mm -hmm. so ongoing or completed. Right. And it can be completed in the past, present, and future, or all of them, but that it's you know, there's a moment in time, like when Yosha became the Passover lamb. It's, he did it in a moment in time. Yeah. Uh, the implications of it are forever and ongoing. Further, this Amar promise of God was made to Yahweh's Am people and family, not to an unknown Gentile church. The 70% of Israelis and Jews worldwide who are not religious, who define themselves as secularists, are reachable in this regard. If you were counted among them as a secularist, this message is for you. Speak the bar. Call a appeal imperative again, so choose to speak, if you will, from the heart. Exercising good judgment, Aleb, unto Jerusalem, and announce summoning her by reciting to her, Kara, that indeed her battles are finished and completed. The consequence of her missing the way is now pardoned through restitution, causing her to be accepted, regaining favor because she has obtained from the hand of Yahweh a double portion for all of her errant and mistaken ways. All right, from a timing point of view, in 33 CE, were Jerusalem's battles finished and completed? No, they had uh, 70 and then 120, 133, and I don't know, lots of... Lots the single worst attack on Israel, uh, the second worst attack on, on Jerusalem, came uh, in uh, in uh, 70 CE. Yeah, now, there were yeah. there were a couple sure. of really bad attacks on Jerusalem prior to that. The Assyrians tried, but they were sent away by Yah. The Babylonians uh, did a pretty good job, but you know the Babylonians uh, just wanted the Jews as slaves. They you know they they hauled them away to save slavery and let them come back. Yeah. They took some some things, but they let them come back. Uh, the Romans. Now that was a, as they say in the Wizard of Oz, that was a horse of a different color. Uh, the Romans. That so, so Israel just this spoke of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem's battles were hardly over in 30 to 33 CE. You had the horrible Roman assault of 70 when the temple was destroyed. You had the even more despicable attack. The the most crushing blow that Israel ever suffered in um, 133 under uh, Hadrian. In the diaspora, causing them to... And then you had, the, yeah, starting the diaspora, and then you had the attack, you know, under uh, under yeah. all of the, the British mandate and the, uh, and the Muslims. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, now, uh, you know, with the Holocaust. So... Mm -hmm. Israel's battles being over, that, that, that's the context of this prophecy on making the way straight. So I'm sorry. Yeah. It could not have uh, been to Yosha in 33 CE because Israel's, and particularly Jerusalem's battles, were just beginning. Yeah. So you know its future. So you know process. its future. And you know it, it could it even be in... Um, well, let's let's just look at the battles um, fought in Jerusalem. The uh, 1948, the War of Independence. No, nope. still more to go. Battle still so it could not have applied prior to then, right? How about 1967 and the Six Day War? Couldn't have applied no, prior to then. How about uh, 1974 and the uh, Yom Kippur War? No, nope. couldn't apply prior to then. How about all of the uh, the Islamic terrorists and uh, Hamas rockets and the uh, and the like. Still ongoing. Yep. You know, how about the uh, the Magog War? How about the uh, how about the Battle of Armageddon? Armageddon. Yep. 
ghetto. Yeah. So the only way for this to be accurate, historically, prophetically, is for it to occur after. Yeah. Yeah. That is correct. Uh, it's, it's not hard to figure this stuff out. God makes it easy for us, so long as you're willing to think. So speak from the heart unto Jerusalem and announce summoning her by reciting to her that indeed her battles, her Shabbat, her time of enduring the presence of armies and her military campaigns are finished and completed. Mali, fulfilled and satisfied, and thus ended and over. And the last time I checked, there wasn't one in a million of the inhabitants of Jerusalem that have reconciled their relationship with Yahweh. The consequence of her missing the way is pardoned through restitution, causing her to be accepted, regaining favor. That has not happened. It will, but it has not, because she had obtained from the hand of Yahweh a double portion for all of her errant and mistaken ways. So let's be honest with ourselves. Let's trust our God and be fair to his beloved son. None of these things occurred circa 30 CE when Yao Kanan proclaimed them in the Jordan River. And most are still ongoing. Yes. Therefore, the prophet Yahshua Yah, is addressing God's family, Yahudah and Yisrael, at a future time when the people are no longer religious and the nation's last battle has been fought and won. Israel has most assuredly not changed her collective mindset towards Yahweh, and the people have not been comforted. Her battles continue, with the worst occurring right after Yahshua's departure in 33 CE, both at the hands of Rome. Even recently, she was forced to fight for her survival as Europeans, Europeans engaged in ethnic cleansing, a.k.a. genocide, mm -hmm. during the last world war. A double portion, indeed. She fought for her independence in 1948, then for her very existence in 1967 and 73. Further, she has two enormous battles which remain, Magog and Armageddon. Therefore, we can conclude with absolute confidence, based upon Yahshua 42 and Yahshua 43, uh, 42, that Yahshua 43 was not fulfilled 2,000 years ago. It, therefore, did not apply to, in quotes, Jesus. God's nation and people are continuing to pay for having missed the way. So let's be blunt. Since this prophecy coincides with the time after which Israel has fought her last battle and has suffered for the last time, her relationship with Yahweh restored. It was not written to protect Yahusha's, Yahusha's experience with Yahweh Kanan in the Yardan Jordan River period. I don't care if you call yourself a Christian, believe that your Bible is the inerrant word of God, or how much you may identify with Jews for Jesus, find affinity with the Messianics, or love the mythos associated with Yeshua. This does not apply even to Yahusha. Get over it. Mm -hmm. And get with the program. What you just said in the last five minutes should make you nasham immediately. I mean, if you really had your mind open you, and your heart open, you, you could see that's absolutely true. There's no question about it. Yeah, and it's it profound. Really it's not just it's not, it's not a little oh, yeah, thing. It. This completely it's negates and it's completely Christianity and completely negates rabbinic Judaism and completely um, throws out for everyone to appreciate and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a relationship with Jod and the role this man plays in Israel, past, present, and future. Absolutely. Amazing stuff. Let's, uh, let's cite the, uh, the passage as it's in uh, yesterday, uh, 43. We're still uh, recording, but uh, it's no longer a live broadcast. I don't think that matters a whole lot in today's uh, situation because... Um, about 90% who listen to the live show call in on their phone, so they're still listening to us. 
Okay. And 95% who listen to this program listen to a podcast and archive of it, not uh, not live. So they listen at their convenience. And that number becomes even greater when you realize how many times this will be played over time. Mm-hmm. A voice calls out, inviting and summoning. Cole Kara. A voice calls out, inviting and summoning. Kara reads and recites, calling out and welcoming to the Mikre. In the wilderness, Baha Midbar, in the desolate and lifeless place without the word. Turn around and choose to change direction such that you are prepared for the way of Yahweh. What did Toad say just a moment ago? We need to turn around and choose to change so that we're prepared. And here it is. Turn around. Change your thinking. Change your direction. Stop being political. Stop being religious. Change. Turn. So that you're prepared for the way of Yahweh. Because the time's coming. Where if you're not, you're dead. Go back. Yeah. The world's going to become so hostile to Yisrael and Yahudah, to Jews and Zionists and to Israelis, that the only place they'll be able to survive is Yisrael. That's why God's calling them home. And even there, they're going to be attacked from every possible direction. And most are going to die. But those who die in recognition of who Yahweh is, who embrace his name, the terms and conditions of his covenant, who attend his invitations to be called out and meet his seven Moed Mikre, that die, death is just a a flicker and the existence of light. And those who survive all that's going to happen between now and 2033 on Yom Kippur when he returns. It takes time to discard all of the rubbish that you've been told that isn't true. And then it takes time to embrace the truth, to know it, to understand it, to act upon it. It doesn't happen in an instant. It takes time. Don't put this off. Your soul is dependent upon it. The souls of those you love is dependent upon it. Turn around now. Change your direction such that you are prepared for the way of Yahweh. By the way, it doesn't say the way of Yosha, does it? It doesn't say make way the, the way of the Lord, does it? No. Nope. The way of Yahweh. Of your own free will, choose to become straightforward and right, making correct and on the level. A raised highway, an elevated ramp, a walkway and gateway through the dark and lifeless wilderness to approach our God. Yes, you have 43. Well, first of all, it begins with a voice calls out. I'm going to tell you that the Khan and the Immersor was not that voice. No. Dode is. A uh, dode is. Absolutely. Yes, is. Mm-hmm. Yahweh is too. That's stranger, is. A voice calls out, inviting and summoning in the wilderness in the deathless and lifeless place without the word. Turn around. Choose to change your direction such as you are prepared for the way of Yahweh. We're also part of that collection of chorus, that mm-hmm. chorus of people calling people out, summoning them in the desolate, lifeless place without the world, encouraging them to turn around so that they're prepared for the way of Yahweh. Of your own free will, choose to become straightforward and right, making correct and on the level. Yeah, sir. This is one of those words that just took us to this place like a magnet. 
Choose to be direct, reliable, and steadfast, standing upright without wandering to and fro, considering the unwavering um, this is Peel imperative. Um, imperative means that it's our choice. Second person volition. The Peel is that what we do is going to influence us. The way we respond to this is going to profoundly influence us, and as you found out, Kirk, influence others. Yeah. And then it's a raised highway, an elevated ramp, a walkway and a gateway. Uh, Mikala, Makala. Uh, by lifting up the upright conduit of one's or conduct of one's life to show the way up. So this elevated highway is us transforming our lives so that we become what did Dote say? Make me like you? Make me like you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we can transform our lives so that we do what Doe did. We get up in the morning and we study God's Word. Now, I understand that that uh, there isn't one in a uh, hundred of us that has the time to devote to this. We have either children at home or jobs and, and things we have to do, obligations in life. And I've got no problem with, with people that are that are wrapped up in the ordinary flow of life benefiting from what we're talking about. Um but for those of us who are in a position to devote more time and to make this a priority, then we can make our lives an elevated ramp, a, a gateway to Yahweh, based upon what we learn and what we share, what we write and what we say. It is from Ka'al, which is to lift up and esteem, respecting the ability to be lifted up out of and above. And this is what's interesting. Out of what? What is this ramp out of? Out of uh, Mr. Uh, Rabah. Babylon, all everything. <laughs> yeah. Now, for me personally, I get a kick out of this because I spent five or six years doing nothing but trying to help people get out of a Rabha. You know, I, uh, uh, meeting with Al-Qaeda, writing Tea with Terrorists, uh, writing Prophet of Doom, doing all the radio shows on Prophet of Doom. Um, I was really committed to uh, to to a Rabha, which a Rabha is a, is a really is a spectacular word. It means uh, dark and uh, lifeless wilderness, a barren and desolate wasteland, an unenlightened and um, association with Arabs through the nocturnal swarms of noxious pests within the gloomy fabric of commingling as a Babylonian reference and through Arabia where the Torah was revealed to approach our God what is the purpose of the rampway? to approach our God what does it go through? the dark and lifeless wilderness of our Rabha, all to approach our God. And God says, do it in a straightforward way. Be on the level. Not too much to ask. Yeah. Just do it in a straightforward way. Mm -hmm. Go where the words lead. Make an honest effort to translate the words accurately and then render them appropriately. I had somebody write me, and it turned out to be a really good person. I thought they were really trying to give me a hard time, and, and um, you know, they wrote, they, they had a different view on uh, the timing of uh, the fulfillment of the Passover lamb, and um, they think it uh, occurred in 31. And, and the study I've done, I've come to um, to 33 is the time, uh, as year 4,000, yeah. And I, I remember writing them because they asked you know, if I had read uh, what they had done because I hadn't responded and I said yeah I, I did see it and I scanned it and, and and you know quite frankly I didn't agree with what they had written and I, I, I sent uh, their analysis to both of you guys You, I didn't hear either one of your response so I, I, I don't I know why well, yeah. I haven't had a chance so to I, look at it yet yeah and uh, we live busy lives and, and you know you can't do all things so I wrote this person back and said listen we just disagreed on it and, and the fact of the matter is that 
I, uh, I have priorities. First priority uh, in disagreements, because he wrote back and said, yeah, I guess you don't like disagreements. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm not being negative here. This person, I've exchanged two or three emails since then. Uh, he's a really good guy. And I, I misinterpreted what he wrote, and I apologize to him. And he, he's a really good guy. He's got it together. He's very thoughtful. Um, and uh, I said, look, the, the things that, if you want to have a disagreement that I'm going to jump on and respond to right away, have it be on one of my translations. If you can show that I goofed on a translation, you're going to get my undivided attention right there because I want it to be right. Because there's nothing that would bother me more than inaccurately conveying the Word of God. So let's start there. You start If you want to have a disagreement with me, and it's going to be on one of my translations, you are going to get my undivided attention. Now, the next thing that I happen to like, I happen to like a scientific uh, analysis. Mm-hmm. And so if I've said something inaccurate, I, I want to know. Uh, I really like terminology. I'm in love with Yahweh's terminology. If I've mis represented an idea based upon the terminology that I'm using. You know, the transliterations, for example, that are found in our programs and our books are found nowhere else. Huge numbers of them are unknown. You know, people will attack me and us, and they'll do so in Yahweh's name. And, and you say, and they're going to be citing the, the Mikra or, or uh, the Bereth for the Covenant, and, uh-huh. and, and you just want to shake them and say, how'd you come to do any of that? No place else. So um, I said, you know, terminology is important. If you disagree on terminology, you're going to get my attention. Uh, I like uh, history. You could uh, do that as well. But if it's going to be timing, you aren't going to get my attention. I really dislike the Julian calendar. I dislike the change from Julian to Gregorian. I dislike the Gregorian calendar. And so this idea of trying to sync calendars with Yahweh's calendar and the Gregorian calendar it's something I do not like. Um, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'll do the best I can to get it as accurate as I can, and then I'm going to move on. So if you want to have a disagree with me on the on the calendar, <laughs> I'm probably not your guy. Uh, you know, I had somebody else write me, what about the Shabbat? How do we know that it's uh, still the you know Friday at sunset and the Saturday at sunset? How do we know? And, you know, with the change in calendars, the answer is we don't. But there's no evidence to show that any other day is more likely and a ton of evidence to suggest that it is still as we are observing it. I mean, it's overwhelming in favor of we got it right and extraordinarily lean in that we've got it wrong. But are, can we be dogmatic? No, because of the changing calendar. That said, I'm not sure I really care. I mean, I, that's too harsh. So the things I care about, it's low on my list because understanding the purpose of the Shabbat is vastly more important than getting the timing right, as it is with the Mikra. If you can get both right, wonderful. But one's a far bigger priority than the other. So, in this statement, where it begins, of your own free will, choose to become straightforward and right. Uh, that's what we should all strive for. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be right in everything. Well, I told you, I began this program telling you about a stupid mistake I made. Uh, when I wrote uh, an introduction to God on, you know, woe is me, I don't have uh, extant in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Exodus uh, 20, uh, Shemot uh, 20, where the ten statements are written, so I can't tell you if it's a shin or a sin. Okay, dummy. Why didn't you look at the body in five where it's repeated? Well, we do have that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And why didn't you recognize that when you read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are no dead, dead, diacritical marks? <laughs> They're indistinguishable. You know, so are we going to get stuff wrong? Yeah, we do. But we strive to correct it when we do. And we work very hard on uh, on being accurate. And that's what God wants. And the reason that we're in this discussion right now, and we'll continue it the next few weeks, is that um, 
we took a very straightforward process to our translations and our interpretations of what we're reading. We use the same process all the time. Kirk, I know you do, and JB, you do as well. Mm -hmm. Our process is always the same. We don't alter it. Um, we translate the words based upon their actionable roots, based upon a review of, of all lexicons we have available to us. And then we always consider the first use and how a term is used throughout the yes, testimony. And we then translate it based upon our understanding of Yah's nature and purpose. Always the, the context in which it's being used. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Context is king. And we do that all the time, always the same way. And if we if we've translated a word a hundred times in a particular way, and we come to a place we can't translate it that way, we'll spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out why. <laughs> oh yeah. And so the process is all the same. It's very straightforward. And then as we come to comment on what we have translated, the process is also straightforward. We make connections. What did we do? We read something in Mismore 5, 8, that was reminiscent of something that we had read um, in the, uh, the account of Yahu Kanan, and that was cited from... Yashia 40. So what do we do? We went there. Yashia 40. Straightforward. That's how you learn. You go there. And if we follow the straightforward procedure, it's going to take us to, in this Yashia 40, it's going to take us through some things that are really profound. Mm -hmm. Like we all know that Yosha cited Do during the most important moment of his life. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you know that Yahweh quoted Dote? Amazing. And not just on anything. It's probably the passage that's read more often than any other passage in Christian churches by pastors. You know, when they say that the flower fades and the, or the, you know, the, the grass fades and the flower, the flower withers, but the word of our God endures forever? Mm-hmm. Or long. Yeah, uh, yeah they, they end their little, you know, their little Bible reading by uh, by citing that. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and then they change the words. <laughs> well, of course, but in its end, Yahshua yeah, forty. Yeah. Yeah, was cited it, and Yahshua yeah, forty. Dode wrote it first. <laughs> yeah, was citing Dode. <laughs> cool. You know, so Dode sung this song to you, and yeah, I said, I really like that. That's really good. I like good. that. I've used that. I like that. I can use that. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think it's just it's it's one of the most like marvelous things I think I've ever read. Yeah. When I read the Yahweh yeah. himself, I quoted Dode. That says a lot for this man, right? Thank you. When you're, when you're smart enough, insightful enough, that you can write something that God's going to quote, Oh, yeah. You're on your game. <laughs> maybe we should pay attention to what this guy has to say. Yeah, well, maybe so. Uh, I, think, I think if God's going to quote him, <laughs> we would be wise <laughs> maybe to you quote him too. as well. <laughs> yeah, we'd be wise to quote him as well. All right, so that that brings us to a good stopping spot. We'll uh, we'll pick it up uh, here in a uh, in a week's time, um, uh, and uh, continue. Uh, through what is just a, uh, a marvelous uh, approach, and I promise that once we're uh, we're through the uh, um, Solomon's dedication, uh, we will uh, return to uh, uh, to the story of Moab. I, I had in the uh, uh, at the end of the last program said that that we were going to deal with um, uh, uh, who was the unnamed witness uh, in the uh, you know, in, um, during the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, and I, said, I would uh, translate what I think I misquoted is uh, Zachariah 5, and it's actually Zachariah 4. Uh, you fellows know that I've already sent you that. I, I did the translation of, uh, of it and, uh, and more. But what I've decided that, that is the appropriate thing to do. Table it for a while. Yeah, I'm just going to. I might table it even forever. It, it has no value to anybody. 
Uh, it's um, the NACRI is it's a whole different story. That's profoundly important because of what God says about it. Two of the other witnesses, and um, now I'm I'm happy to discuss why God would pick somebody that wasn't one of His prophets of old, and how that uh, that lesson is is taught to it by why He chose Moshe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we can we can talk about it and anticipate it and, and think about it, but to try to point to a person and say it's this person, I think is. Uh, Serves uh, serves no purpose. It uh, it might even be counterproductive. So we're not going to do that. But um, uh, we will absolutely consider what what Solomon had to say about the Necre. And and Dode, by the way, wrote about him as well, uh, using the verbal root of Necre, which is Nekar. Um, that's important because Yahweh know, would not have had that revealed um, if he didn't think it was extremely important to his people and their return. And the context it, it's presented in, it's extremely important to Yisrael and Yahudah. So if you are a Jew or an Israeli and you're listening to this at some future date, that is where we're headed. And God has some well, uncompromising words to say about this individual and how you should respond based upon what he has to say and what he has written. So that's where we're headed. We're, we just won't go beyond that. And then we're going to return to the story of Moab because it is so um, important to our overall understanding of, of um, why Israel, Israel... Where Israel is. Uh, that is correct. Yeah. It's the story. Yes, indeed. All right, my friends. Welcome back, yeah, JB. Pleasure. Yeah, glad to be yeah. back. Hopefully I'll yeah. be here for a while now. Oh, good. I'm, I'm delighted. And my little uh, puppy, uh, she's not a little puppy anymore. She's a full-size dog. She just acts like a puppy. But uh, unlike the last there. program where she was really talkative, she's she's uh, back taking a nap. So um, <laughs> a little dog. quieter tonight. Yeah. All right. Good night. Shabbat shalom. Talk to you guys Bye. next week. Hello. Good night, baby. All right. Bye.